Kathy, can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Good morning. It's my pleasure to call this meeting of the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality to order. Today is Wednesday, June 30th, 2021. The time is 9.31 now. And with us today are Commissioners Emily Lindley and Bobby Janeka, as well as our General Counsel, Mary Smith. I'm John Nearman. Um, while we are at the dais today, this is, again, a hybrid meeting, so I'm going to uh, ask you to please bear with us through any technical difficulties. I think things went reasonably smoothly last week. I hope the same will be true today. Um, but uh, to be clear, most of the participants um, are with us virtually. So I'd like to remind folks to please keep their phones on mute when they're not speaking. And also, anyone who's here only to listen can watch the meeting online. And that link is available on the agenda notice. For each item where argument or, is dis or discussion is allowed, we will inform speakers of their time limits. Registration has now closed, but if you'd like to address the Commission on a particular item, please email agenda at tceq.texas.gov with your name, affiliation, and the item you'd like to comment on, and we will do our best to accommodate that request. For those who are making presentations, please wait and to begin until either I or our general counsel have asked you to begin speaking, and please check to make sure that your, uh, that your line is unmuted before you speak. And with that, I'd like to thank everyone for being present. Colleagues, we have a very full agenda today, so let's get to it. Um, Ms. Smith, we're going to take up old business one and two together with the enforcement docket later in the agenda, so please call item one. Item number one is the petition for the creation of Poetry Road Municipal Utility District of Rockwell County. The parties have been notified that the commission will not take oral argument, but may ask questions. Those who have signed in will be noted for the record. Thank you. So colleagues, this is not our typical Senate Bill um, 709, House Bill 801 hearing request. This, this one falls under Chapter 55, Subchapter G of our rules which requires us to determine whether a requester is entitled to a hearing, but not to identify referred issues. Nevertheless, the affected person analysis is similar in that the requester must establish a personal justiciable interest. And in this case, I think Mr. Hepner has made that demonstration by establishing his proximity to the proposed district and raising concerns about flooding resulting from the planned improvements. Concerns about drainage are expressly referenced in the statute pertaining to district creation at Texas Water Code Section 54.021B3E, so I would grant his request. Ms. Matthews, on the other hand, has expressed concerns about traffic and rural peace of mind, which, um, while they are certainly understandable concerns, they're outside the statutory factors that the legislature has identified, so I would deny her request. Um, and so I'm recommending that we refer the matter to SOA on uh, Mr. Hepner's uh, petition. And uh, I'm interested in your thoughts. Commissioner Lindley? Um, I, I'm in agreement. You know, I did struggle a little with this one just because um, it presents such a close call um, because he is outside of the district, his property is, but because of the proximity to the district and um, the relevant issues he raised, I'm I'm fine granting um, him a hearing and uh, and denying Ms. Matthews a hearing. So. Thank you. Commissioner Janeko, I'll entertain additional thoughts or a motion. I reached the same conclusion. And with, with that suggestion, I'll move forward to move that we grant the hearing request of Brian Hoffner. We refer the matter to SOA for a contested case hearing on the petition, and we refer the matter to the Commission's Alternative Dispute Resolution Program to run concurrently with SOA's preliminary hearing scheduling efforts. Um, I have one comment, sorry. I, I know that this isn't quite 709, but um, I think we should try and put a time limit on it like we usually do for SOA hearing referrals. Just the standard 180 days. If I should have said that a minute ago, I apologize. But I would support that motion if you'd be willing to add in a 180 day time frame. I, I think I'm in agreement there and I would ask Ms. Smith how we might modify the <laughs> motion I made. Sorry about that. 
Um, you can modify the motion to ask that um, the hearing, let me find some language for you. Wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Lindley. That was, that was something that I uh, had a note to, to want to discuss with each of y'all. Uh, Chairman, do you have any concerns or consideration there? Well, two, I think maybe we could just accept that as a friendly amendment to the motion that's been made and seconded and take a vote. So procedurally, can we do that? That's my first question. The other question I think we've already gotten past, which is, is it, per is it permissible for us to m impose a deadline on this referral? I think the answer is yes, but uh, I'd like to confirm that as well. Yes, you can put a deadline on it. Okay. And procedurally, can we simply call yes. a vote on the friendly amendment? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Let so. me find you some, some language for that. So we've got it tied up. I probably should have that since it was my idea, huh? Um, you could add to that amendment, establish a hearing duration of 180 days. All right, so why don't we take it from the top and hear, hear a new motion. Perfect, let me try that. I would move that we grant the hearing request of Brian Hoffner, refer the matter to SOA for a contested case hearing on the petition, establish a hearing duration of 180 days, and refer the matter to the Commission's Alternative Dispute Resolution Program to run concurrently with SOA's preliminary hearing scheduling efforts. I second that motion. The motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 The motion carries. Ms. Smith, please call the next item. Item number two is the consideration of whether to affirm, modify, or set aside the emergency order appointing a temporary manager for four public water systems owned and operated by the estate of Marion J. Smith. The ED should speak first as the movement, followed by the respondent, if present. Hearing requesters, presently there are none. The temporary manager, um, if present, I don't believe he is on the line. And OPIC, the general counsel's office recommends a five minute time limit on each party's presentation. Thank you, and uh, is there someone with the executive director's uh, staff on the line? Yes, can you hear me? Loud and clear, go ahead. Good morning, Chairman, Commissioners, General Counsel, and Public Interest Counsel. My name is Benjamin Warms, and I'm an attorney with the Litigation Division representing the Executive Director. With me today is Taylor Pearson, also with the Litigation Division, Nima Montahem with the Water Supply Division, and Jason Lindemann of the Lubbock Regional Office. Item number two is the emergency order appointing a temporary manager of the four water systems owned by the estate of Mary and Jay Smith. The four water systems are Town North Village, Plot Acres, Cox Edition, and Town North Estates. All four water systems are under a single certificate of convenience and necessity, number 11168, and total 296 service connections. On April 20th, 2021, the TCQ Lubbock Regional Office received numerous complaints of a water outage at Town North Village, and that customers had been unable to get in contact with anyone representing the utility in weeks. That evening, a TCEQ investigator confirmed that there was a water outage at Town North Village, documenting that there was no water pressure at the system. The investigator determined that the outage was caused when electric power was shut off to the system due to non-payments of electric bills. On April 22, 2021, a TCQ investigator conducted investigations at all four water systems and documented that at Town North Village, Plot Acres, and Town North Estates, there was insuffic insufficient disinfectant residual in the distribution system and that a licensed operator could not be identified at any of the systems. The Lubbock Regional Office investigated the situation and found that the CCN holder and listed owner and operator of the utility, Marion J. Smith, had passed away in January of 2021. Investigators also found that at the time of Marion Smith's death, the utility was being operated by, by Jimmy Midkiff. Subsequently, during the spring of 2021, Mr. Midkiff suffered a severe medical emergency, causing him to cease operating the utility completely leaving the utility without anyone to conduct basic maintenance and operation of the water system. 
Given these issues, the utility was determined to be abandoned, creating a substantial risk of imminent water outages and posing health hazards to the 750 customers served by the utility. Because of this, on May 5, 2021, the Executive Director issued an emergency order appointing Intermediary Solutions Holdings, LLC, as temporary manager for an initial term of 180 days. The utility is currently providing continuous and adequate service to the customers, has begun properly disinfecting the water, and is working with the customers to correct various other issues that arose while the utility was abandoned. The Executive Director respectfully requests you affirm the May 5, 2021 emergency order with the modification recommended by the Executive Director to correct a minor typographical error. We are available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Warms. I have none. Commissioner Lindley, any questions? No questions. Thank you. Commissioner Janeka? None. None? Okay. Uh, is there anyone here for the respondent? Is Ms. Smith here? Anybody here to represent the respondent or the executor of the respondent's estate? Hearing none, I understand that nobody has signed in to request a hearing. Um, and how about our temporary managers? Is Mr. Parker on the line? My understanding is that he isn't on the line. Is not, okay. No one from Intermediate Solutions Holdings. So let's hear next from OPIC. Mr. McWhorter, are OPIC you there? OPIC agrees. Yes, I am here. I am here, Chairman. OPIC agrees with the Executive Director that the emergency order is needed to ensure adequate and continuous service to the utilities, customers. We recommend affirming and modifying the May 5th emergency order appointing this temporary manager of the utility as proposed by the executive director. Thank you, Mr. McWhorter. Um, I want to begin by thanking Intermediate Solutions Holdings for, for taking this on, through, for working through these problems and um, returning service at these systems. Um, I do think it's appropriate to go ahead and, and uh, affirm the order and uh, we'll invite any additional comments or a motion. I, I have a motion. Um, I would move that we affirm the ED's May 5th, 2021, <clears throat> excuse me, emergency order appointing Intermediary Solutions Holdings, LLC, as temporary manager for the water utility owned and operated by the estate of Marion J. Smith with the following modification. Change the number 4409 and finding of fact paragraph 4 to 4406 and issue an order approving the ED's emergency order as modified by this motion. I second the motion. The motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 The motion carries. Ms. Smith, please call the next item. Item number three is the consideration and hearing on a resolution from Denton County Freshwater Supply District number 12 requesting the approval of additional drainage powers. Denton County Freshwater Supply District number 12 has requested the approval of the additional powers and should present the item followed by the ED interested persons but currently nobody signed in and then OPIC the general counsel's office recommends a standard five minutes for oral presentations and good morning is Mr. Eidman on the line yes good morning this is Scott Eidman on behalf of Denton 12 uh, to provide a little bit of background on this district it was created in 2018 as a freshwater supply district uh, and later converted to a water control and improvement district in 2019 and that is why we are seeking drainage powers today thank you mr eidman uh i understand the the history of this it's it's a couple steps in the process but i think this this is a pretty uh straightforward matter colleagues um i don't see any issues with this request the district appears to have met all the requirements for these additional powers including uh showing economic feasibility so i think we should move forward I agree. I'm also in agreement. I would make the motion that we grant the request by Denton County Freshwater Supply District number 12 for approval of additional drainage powers and issue the executive director's proposed order. I second. And before we take a vote, I, I uh, skipped over Mr. McWhorter. I didn't invite his thoughts. So before we cement this deal, Mr. McWhorter, what are your thoughts? Uh, I, I agree with all of you. OPIC recommends approval of the order authorizing additional drainage power for Denton County Freshwater Supply District Number 12 as presented by the Executive Director. 
Thank you. Sorry to uh, over, overlook you there, but we got your comments in. The motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 The motion carries. Ms. Smith, please call the next item. Item number four is the consideration of material changes to contracts for goods and services awarded under Chapter 2155 of the Texas Government Code ex executed during the previous quarter. The Executive Director's staff is here to present this item. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman, Commissioners, General Counsel, and Public Interest Counsel. For the record, my name is Allison Scott, Compliance Evaluator for the Procurement and Contract Section of the Financial Administration Division. I am representing the Executive Director. This item contains the material changes made to contracts and purchases for goods and services between December 1st, 2020 through February 28th, 2021. Reported material changes include extensions of the contract or completion of work for six months or more, or an increase in consideration of 10% or more. In accordance with section 2155.088 of the government code, the executive director presents these items for your consideration. I am available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Scott. I have none. Commissioner Lindley, any questions? I don't have any questions, but I would note, I think today is Greg Wise's last day at the agency. So best of luck to Greg if he's listening or even still with us at the agency. <laughs> but I don't have any questions. Thank you. I, I appreciate that sentiment. I'm, I'm, I always have to lament the, the loss of our, our good public servants to other avenues of public service. So uh, second that, that sentiment, and I... I uh, don't think we have a, we do have a motion, yeah. Well, let, let's, I was just asking if you had any questions Thanks. for the executive director. Yeah. <laughs> I'm assuming none. None. Okay. Great. Um, Thanks. Well, while we're at it, let me thank Greg, too, for your, for your service. I wasn't aware that you were uh, moving on, but we appreciate your service. Um, no one has signed in on this matter, so Mr. McWhorter, what are your thoughts? OPIC recommends approval of the resolution regarding material changes to contracts for goods and services as presented by the ED. Thank you. And colleagues, I do agree with that. I think we should uh, approve issuance of this resolution. And I'll invite any additional thoughts or congratulations <laughs> or, um, or a motion. Um, I, I will move that we approve issuance of the executive director's proposed resolution that acknowledges the material changes to contracts for goods and services in accordance with Texas Government Code Section 2155.088 for the period of December 1, 2020 to February 28, 2021, as described in the TCEQ Interoffice Memorandum to the Commissioners and Executive Director dated June 30, 2021 in docket number 2021-0711-MIS. I second the motion. The motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 The motion carries. Ms. Smith, please call the enforcement docket. That takes us to old business items one and two and new business items five through 30. The executive director's staff is here to present these matters. Good morning. Good morning, chairman, commissioners, general counsel and public interest counsel. For the record, my name is Melissa Cordell of the Enforcement Division, and with me today is Brian Sinclair, also of the Enforcement Division, and Charmaine Backens of the Litigation Division, representing the Executive Director. Pending before you are items, old business items 1 and 2, and new business items 5 through 30. The total assessed administrative penalties are $824,098, with $121,998 deferred, $180,184 applied for supplemental environmental projects and $521,916 to the general revenue. We respectfully request approval of these items and are available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Cordell. I have none. Commissioner Lindley, any questions? Um, no, no questions. Commissioner Janeka. Um, I'm, I'm good, yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, so we have uh, several people um, who have signed in to speak on various items, and let's just take them in order. Beginning with Old Business One, Carlos Blanco has signed in to speak. Mr. Blanco, are you there? I just got a note that Mr. Blanco is having some trouble um, logging in. And let me ask if um, Kristen Adams wishes to speak on Old Business One. Good morning. Um, yes, Commissioner. Um, I, I actually have a copy of Mr. Blanco's statement, so 
due to the technical difficulties. Um, I'll be reading that on his behalf. Great. Thank you, Ms. Adams. Okay. Um, so I'll be reading from his point of view. So these are his words. Thank you. As the founder of Aguas, I have been in contact with individuals personally affected by the city of Laredo's ongoing water quality issues and violations and would like to share a few of their comments on the proposed agreed order before you today. A concerned citizen wrote to me that a findings order is essential for the simple fact that without one, the city of Laredo will continue to rely on the proven fact that a slap on the wrist punishment is worth continued violations. It's worked out for them in the past. One more, <clears throat> one more approved agreed order will just continue the seemingly agreed upon pattern that could eventually lead to mass waterborne illness. This would be especially bad for the impoverished children and elderly in Laredo, the one demographic which has historically been victimized by inadequate state agency enforcement action against the city. A local pastor for the Colonias, Pastor Ramos, said the following, the city of Laredo must accept their responsibility of guilt for not advising the community on time regarding the September 2019 boil water notice. By not issuing a timely boil water notice, the city of Laredo put the consumers of the public water supply at risk, and we wish not to ever see this happen again. <clears throat> As these comments indicate, it is extremely important to the people of Laredo that there be a findings order that the city of Laredo admits fault for failing to issue a September 2019 boil water notice on time. It's not right for TCEQ to let the city deny any fault in the agreed order, which its investigation found that the city violated the boil water notice rule in bad faith. The people of Laredo will surely lose trust and confidence in TCEQ unless it requires a findings order that says the city of Laredo was wrong. The city of Laredo must take responsibility and admit guilt. The city of Laredo, the city of Laredo leadership must take responsibility for their actions. Thank you, Ms. Adams, and uh, please thank Mr. Blanco for preparing those remarks. Um, there's no one else signed in to speak on Old Business 1, so let's move to Old Business 2. And I understand we have Mr. James Hodges on the line for Quick Crete. Are you there, sir? Yes, I am. Yep. And I want to say, first of all, I'm sorry, but I was supposed to be on the docket, I think, a little while ago, and I was a little confused about the process here, so I appreciate you guys taking the time to listen to me this time. Yeah, of course. Glad to do it. Yeah, we're taking things a little bit out of order just so we could have our enforcement items all, all together. But, uh, Mr. Hodges, the floor is yours, and, and uh, you can offer any, any comments you want. And some of the commissioners may have questions for you, or they may not, but uh, the floor is yours. Okay. I guess um, I'm, I'm kind of a little bit confused on how this all works here. Cause so, basically, just a little short story here. So, you guys came out to my plant a couple times, uh, you know, put together all your findings. And then I went down to Austin and met with uh, Mr. Dela Cruz and, and one other individual as well. And, you know, wrote up all of our findings. We just had a nice conversation there. Um, then basically he came back a little while later and said, Hey, you know, I, I understand what you guys are, you know, what you came back for responses with, but I don't know, I don't necessarily agree with them or what the final uh, caveat was, but that was fine. And then, uh, you know, I was assessed the fine and we, we paid the fine and then, uh, I guess that's kind of where we're at now. I guess I'm not 100% sure what, what more you guys need from us, but I'd be more than willing to give you whatever you needed. Um, Margarita had reached out and uh, said if I could, you know, give you guys any additional either capture and abatement equipment stuff that we fixed up there or record keeping stuff or anything along that. So I, you know, I put together a document and sent that on as well. So you guys hopefully should have that. So I guess it's more of just a question of what, what you guys need from me here. Great question, and um, government processes are, are confusing. I wish there were a better way to do it. We're always looking for better ways to do it, but let me try to explain to you where, where we are. You know, everything is like you said. Um, you know, the agency identified some concerns at your facility. Um, you all worked together. You came to an agreed order. Um, that agreed order can't take effect until the three of us, the commission, acts publicly on it, and it was... Um, it was set for the last agenda, um, and most of these items um, go through without, um, you know, without any without any hangups. Um, Commissioner Janeka, I recall, had some additional questions on on this particular one, so he asked to um, continue it, um, continue your item to this agenda. So, what's before us is the same thing that was before us last time, which is 
are we ready to approve the, the agreed order that, that you negotiated or not? Um, so at this point, let me hand it off to Commissioner Janeka and make sure that uh, he gets any of his questions answered. Commissioner? Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Hodges, so much for, for being available today. I appreciate you uh, making yourself available to answer questions. And, and I did just have one question, uh, a few questions from the, the last agenda that I, I would love to give you some opportunity to address here uh, because of the, the public facing element that the chairman uh, discussed that this last step as it comes before us uh, entails. And so I would really just love to hear from you uh, specifically. Could you please tell us what operating policies or procedures you have modified or adopted since the time of these alleged violations? Uh, mostly just making sure that all of our special conditions within our permit are, you know, being followed through. I, I think we mm -hmm. understood, you know, what we needed to do, but just putting better policies in place here. So basically we, at the time when this was all going on, this has been three years ago, you know, we had a sweeper that we ran daily, but I don't think we were necessarily doing a very good job of notating the sweeper usage and everything along that line. So we've, we've since modified that, you know, we, we bought a brand new sweeper. I don't know if you guys saw the new thing that I sent to Margarita, but we upgraded you know, from an older model to a brand, I mean, this thing was $30,000. It's awesome. So it does, this, you know, it's a great job. So we run that. We're keeping our super logs. Uh, we got a water truck that we run, you know, whenever we're seeing that we've got, you know, uh, some sort of dusting conditions going on there. Um, you know, just constantly trying to upgrade, honestly. I mean, we, we went from a paper, a bag house check system to an electronic bag house check system. So now every single one of our bag houses is on like a maintenance software with our iPad. So our, you know, there's no, you know, before you do it on paper, there's always that possibility, you know, like, hey, did bag house 17 get checked last week? Well, okay, you know, if you go back to the paper, but now it's all electronic and they can't move on to their next bag house inspection with the one prior done. So, you know, that's just a little, you know, better system in place there. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm just trying to, you know, be good neighbors for everyone around here and just, you know, do the best we can. We did a, we did a huge half a million dollar project to replace our aggregate bins. I don't know if you guys saw those pictures, but that was a crazy undertaking there. Um, you know, those things are enormous bins there so we took all that out to make sure that you know all of our you know our bins are you know as good as condition as they can possibly be um yeah and, and just going through you know everything we can to just you know to make this place as clean as we possibly can here i appreciate the response i think it's very thorough and and very much what i hope to hear from our regulated entities when uh when confusion or snags over uh, their obligations may bring us around to us in, in the uh, enforcement docket here. And I, I sincerely appreciate it, particularly the uh, two words you, news, you use there, uh, endeavoring or aspiring to be a good neighbor. And, and I really appreciate and, and think that that captures exactly where I wanted to see our regulated entities, entities uh, occupying the space in, in terms of relationship with the public. So I don't have any further questions, and I, I really do appreciate you taking the time to make yourself available today. So thank you so much. Thank you, Commissioner Janeka. Thank you, Mr. Hodges. Um, Commissioner Lindley, any thoughts, questions, comments at this point? Uh, no, thank you. Okay, great. Uh, moving on, um, we have a couple of folks signed in on item 23. Um, let's begin with Mr. Beard. Uh, are you there, sir? Mr. Beard, I, I don't know if you can hear me, but I cannot hear you yes i can hear you can you hear me i can not not real loud but uh I, I think i hear you well enough you might speak up just a little bit and i think i have lost you now chairman they self-muted mr beard you might might double check your. Unmuted. Okay, I've unmuted. I've unmuted. I... Okay, I, I hear you, you now. Me? If you'll just speak up a little bit, Mr. Beard, uh, state your name and affiliation for the record, and and then the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commission members. My name is John Beard of Port Arthur, Texas. I am the founder and CEO of Pecan, the Port Arthur Community Action Network, and I'm here to speak to the issue regarding the Savannah Delhi case. And uh, what I want to say with regard to that is uh, that I believe the penalties that you all are enforcing or plan to enforce here uh, don't address the harm that was done by the censor. Uh, in reading the TCEQ's mission statement 
and also its purpose. It says that you strive to protect our state's public health, while at the same time the goal being that of having clean air and water and the safe management of waste. In the case of the Savannah Delhi, I believe personally that this did not happen to take place. And I'm sure you've looked at some of the pictures that we sent to you there with regard to the damage that was done by this Delhi that lives in close proximity to a number of the neighbors here. Let me also say to you that this event happened at the height of Hurricane Harvey, when there was massive flooding going on throughout the city. And in this case, the oil that came from we, that property was uh, ended up getting on the houses, inside the homes, on the vehicles, and on much of the property, on the grass and areas surrounding those homes in that vicinity. What I want to talk to you about is the effect that this has on health. That was not just the floodwaters we had to deal with that were laced with uh, waste materials, wastewater, and even sewage, but now you have this heavy oil. And we know this to be heavy oil, not gasoline by its appearance, and at the same time, gasoline because of its nature, given my experience in the petrochemical industry, would have evaporated. So we're quite sure that this is oil and with a great deal of certainty. And we know that oil in its various forms is carcinogenic. It is highly toxic. And it is recommended that you do not have contact with or breathe its vapors or directly come in contact with the liquid. So therefore, in noticing what has happened here, the owner of the deli showed extreme negligence and gross disregard for the community because we believe he was illegally dumping this oil at that facility. And in doing so, he caused damage and potential harm to his neighbors. He was not being, as I heard said earlier, a good neighbor. He showed little remorse in his actions by the way he went about trying to clean up and remediate it. Instead of cleaning up the oil, he basically took a weed eater to it and cut their grass. That did absolutely nothing for the oil that got in their homes and got on their furniture and furnishings, possibly their clothing and on their carpets. That did absolutely nothing to address the oil that got inside their homes along with these flood waters. So I want you to try to put yourself in the place of these people. I want to also go back to what your mission statement says. When it, and it also says that you try to exercise common sense in occurrence with the law and to be consistent in your decisions. And I think that the level of fine and penalty imposed is not consistent with that decision because it does not address the harm nor the negligence that was created by this incident. And it also shows that there's a basically a slap on the wrist to the owner, and it sends a message to other owners that if you do a little something, pay a little fine and go on about your business, not a whole lot's going to come out of it. That's not good. Keep in mind that people were affected, women and children, their homes, their, some of their most valued possessions, the biggest possessions some of them will ever have in their lives, were the adversely affected and contaminated by this oil that came from this property. So in closing, I'd like to ask you to be mindful and to reconsider the amount of uh, penalty that you're imposing upon him. And I want you to remember this one thing in closing, too. He's still in business. He's not selling oil and gas, but he still has those the potential to do harm because he was not directly in that sale at the time anyway. But yet, he created this damage. So thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Mr. Beard. Um, we really appreciate hearing your comments. Um, I think on the same item we have uh, Amy Din, Ms. Din, signed in to speak. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. This is Amy Din with Lone Star Legal Aid appearing on behalf of Port Arthur Community Action Network. And echoing the comments of John Beard that you've just heard, we submitted written comments to the commission in December 2018, which contained an inspection report, as well as pictures of the damage that was done uh, from this facility to the neighboring communities, as well as uh, pictures of the spill for uh, the commission's review. This penalty relates to the release of an oily substance on or about September 1st, 2017 during Hurricane Harvey. The published administrative order, specifically paragraphs five and six, make clear that the penalty relates to a release discovered on September 1st, 2017 that was not reported to TCQ until March of 2018. 
the operator admitted that the release occurred and reported the release to his insurance company. The actual release of waste oil harmed members of Port Arthur community. Actual harm was caused because the floodwaters were full of the oil that came from this location. As documented in the inspection report, the oil stained grass and foliage up to three houses down, and the floodwaters that invaded those houses on 19th Street were full of oil. Our complaint regarding the proposed administrative order was made in December 2018. It took the TCQ two and a half years to respond to these comments. In September 2017, the TCQ responded to complaints from the community regarding the spill. Then as detailed in the inspection report and, and, and our comments, the operator acted in bad faith with respect to the spill, not reporting it, not cleaning it up, and definitely not making it right with the neighbors directly impacted by this release. TCQ's penalty is assessed for only a potential release, but as stated in the administrative order findings, the administrative order relates to the September 1st, 2017 release. This TCQ penalty is being minimized by calling it potential when all of the documentation related to this file shows it was actual. Thus, the penalty does not comply with the penalty policy and severely understates the severity of the penalty that should be applied, particularly where the operator did not act in good faith as documented by the TCQ investigator on the scene during Hurricane Harvey. In fact, the operator repeatedly lied to the TCQ, which is the word used in the inspection reports. Our comments submitted back in December 2018 are detailed regarding the miscalculation of the penalty and the harm inflicted on nearby residents. We need TCQ to look at this administrative order more closely. Why the TCQ wants to minimize or obscure the miscalculation of this penalty for two and a half years is really beyond comprehension. The claim that the TCQ still hasn't figured out what caused the spill is not reassuring either. The fact that the operator didn't have an oil waste permit but clearly released waste oil is not something the TCQ should ignore. It needs to penalize and then there appears to be no effort to do so. So if there was an actual release, are they not going to penalize the operator for that release? What is the purpose of the administrative order process if this is not what the TCQ is here to do? Based on the discussions with the um, underground storage tank unit, it does not appear that there were leaks from the underground storage tank. And moreover, this is not a substance that looks like gasoline that would have come for those tanks. So more likely this case involves illegal dumping of waste material. The TCQ has the ability to require cleanup when there is a spill. That authority was not done here to the satisfaction of residents next door, which is another reason why these comments were filed. The TCQ in his response to comments specifically states it has no responsibility to clean it up if it cannot tell what caused the documented spill. Again, that is not the fastest satisfactory response. So instead of penalizing the penalty for bad conduct and the failure to fully remediate this release, the TCQ is letting them off the hook. It's unclear why the TCQ is taking that position in response to a formal comment that it does not have the authority to make a polluter clean up their spill adequately and cannot penalize them for the failure to make a report to authorities, investigate the cause of spill, or clean it up. Our comments gave specific actions such as power washing and cleaning that could have occurred that the TCQ ignored. At the very least, requiring the company to clean up its mess sufficiently should be the very essential function of the TCQ. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. Den. Appreciate your comments. Um, so my understanding of this item, and I'm going to ask staff to uh, chime in and help us straighten it out, is that what's before us today are violations relating to a storage tank, which contained fuel, not oil. Um, you know, there uh, certainly accept, accept the description that there was waste oil release, Ms. Din, you said that that most likely was illegal dumping um, by, if I understood you correctly, was illegal dumping by the respondent here. Um, I, I believe that we have a, um, a remediation matter that we're working with respect to the waste oil, but we'll, I'll ask for some clarification from staff. So um, my understanding is that what's before us is just 
one part of the issue and that what I've heard Ms. Din, you and Mr. Beard speak to was was um, about waste oil, which is which is not the subject of this um, enforcement order. So um, with that, let me let me invite staff and I don't know if that's uh, you, Ms. Cordell or Mr. Sinclair to um, um, to address the comments that you've heard. Um, and I'd like you to to include in that um, specifically what was found in the investigation, um, why this was um, identified as a potential release, not an actual release, and, um, and what we did with the, the reporting, um, or what you can comment on it with respect to documentation of uh, the operator lying to TC. TCEQ, Ms. Din said that that was in the investigation report. So I'm just going to throw that that whole ball over over to staff for now. We might need to get somebody else um, to address the remediation piece. But Ms. Cordell, Mr. Sinclair, um, please go ahead when you're ready. Uh, good morning, Chairman. This is Brian Sinclair for the Executive Director. Uh, the investigation that, that resulted in the in referral to enforcement, uh, uh, I documented the, the failure to report a suspected release to TCQ within 24 hours of the discovery, and this was based on some on a, on an insurance claim that the, that the respondent uh, made in regards to losing, uh, losing some uh, fuel from the super unleaded tanks. It did not refer to waste oil. Uh, this was based on records. It did, it, this was a separate investigation from the emergency response investigation that occurred uh, in the September 1st through November 1st, 2017 timeframe. The uh, in, in emergency response investigation that, that was conducted in that time frame was not referred to enforcement. It was referred uh, to the remediation division uh, for handling. And so that's you know that that's where that that's where where that particular one went. Uh, there was uh, no uh, real documentation that that said that the respondent had engaged in some sort of illegal dumping or something, you know, along those lines. Uh, and so, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Those, I, I think I may have missed that. Uh, I don't I don't believe that there was any documentation that uh, of of illegal dumping. I, uh, of, of oil or eagle, illegal disposer of oil, uh, but there was that uh, that investigation that did occur in that time frame, and that and that it seemed to, or they identified it as as, as coming from Texas KSD Enterprise, but it's not the same substance that was uh, was alleged to have been lost uh, in the investigation that, that resulted in the enforcement action, which was from the super unleaded tanks. Okay, so um, do I understand that that um, the respondent made an insurance claim for an actual loss of fuel? That's right. Okay, and if that's the case, um, do, how does it make sense to call it a potential release when it sounds to me like he's um, said that there was an actual release and loss. We did not have the documentation of, of, the, uh, of the, the, the fuel that, that went out. I mean, that, that wasn't, the discharge wasn't, wasn't documented. It was based solely on records, and so it wasn't clear whether it was a, whether it really happened, it was it was fuel that was um, missing. So that's that's typically how. And well, I don't know that this case is is very typical. First of all, um, but we we handled it as a suspected release because we didn't have, um, you know, the the investigation that documented it was pretty long after the fact. Sure. Um, are, you, are you in a position to speak about the misrepresentations or, or, or lies? Give us, give the commission a little bit more insight into, into that um, comment. 
you know, I am not, as we, you know, when, when that was said, I've started looking through the investigation, trying to find exactly where that was stated, but um, I'm not prepared to make any other, any comment on that. Sure. Um, okay. I think um, that's all the questions I have on on the matter before us for you right now. I'm going to want to talk to somebody from remediation here in just a minute. But colleagues, um, you know what I'm thinking. You know, with respect just to the fuel that was lost, not talking about waste oil yet, is I certainly have some questions, and I'm wondering, you know, do we do we continue this item or do we remand it for um, for staff to look at the totality of, of the circumstances, including the insurance claim, to take a take a fresh look at um, at how the penalty was calculated on these violations. And I don't know if you have any thoughts or additional questions for anyone at this point. But let me just that's that's what my thinking is on the lost fuel. I, I thought you raised an excellent point. That was a great question. Um, so I'm a little torn on what to do. My knee-jerk reaction is maybe continue it, but I, I don't know. It might be, um, I don't know if that's a better approach or a better approach would be to remain it back to the executive director. Um, I don't know right now. <laughs> but I don't have Janaka. any questions. I, I think a, a truly complicating piece of this, uh, Mr. Sinclair described it as a, a unique case, and I think any any cases that have origins in, in the dates of major hurricanes hitting our state certainly fall into that category. Uh, I think the open question around that waste oil, uh, the origin of that leak, I, I, I'm, I'm conflicted because part of the ordering provisions in this agreed order for this uh, this order dealing with the, the allegations around the lost fuel oil or fuel uh, refined fuel products are entirely separate from the waste oil that clearly contaminated the property and the neighbor's property. And uh, I think that, that that speaks to the common sense element of our agency's uh, mission just as much as anything else does. I don't think that any member of the public would, would expect us to push forward and assert that there was uh, anything involving directly tying the two where, where fuel products were what were missing in the insurance report, and that's what brought this particular enforcement item in front of us, and there's still an open question, an open enforcement item with, with no clear blame, no clear answer to it necessarily. Uh, as to the waste oil, uh, I, I would hope that if, if Executive Director had additional time to work on the case, given the length of time since it's been initiated, that, that they can come back with a, a more complete answer. Seeing these two items together on the docket might give us a very different picture than trying to surmise where the rest of the story may have entered into it. I would love to get it dispensed and have an ordering provision uh, over this respondent's head to say, go forward and figure it out. Uh, on the other hand, I'm not sure whether, uh, perhaps we'll, we'll just, uh, I'll put that question to Executive Director staff. Do you, uh, do you think that a remand might enhance your ability to work with uh, this respondent to, to move forward on the other enforcement items, of the other action items, or uh, can, am I correct in presuming with the presence of the docket, the item on today's docket, that, that executive director staff, y'all saw more value in moving forward with the proposed agreed order as it is before us, and, and you perhaps see more value in getting, getting the respondent into compliance and getting answers from them as to the uh, questions on the other enforcement action with the, the waste oil? And I don't know how to concisely restate that question for staff, but um, Mr. Sinclair, could you or someone else from, from ED staff perhaps comment to whether, uh, whether this proposed order before, before us is, is, in y'all's opinion, the best tools to, to continue moving this respondent forward to investigating the cause of the release? Commissioner Janeka, let me, let me Thank you. propose something here. Yes, please. Um, why don't we hear from remediation staff and get um, gather sort of their understanding of the waste oil um, um, issue of that release as background information, and then maybe you can um, uh, reframe or rephrase your question for Mr. I like Sinclair. that approach far better. Thank you. Okay. Do we have anybody from staff um, who can speak to the waste oil um, remediation um, part that's been raised here? Um, Chairman, this is Brian Sinclair. I do not believe we have uh, 
someone from remediation that on that I'm aware of that's on on that would be able to speak to this and therefore either a a continuation or a remand to to give um give them an opportunity to uh to be prepared to provide a thorough answer um would would probably be best here okay um and and, and colleagues I'm curious whether you know whether we have a notice issue perhaps too because this is noticed for enforcement on a PST and is getting into remediation a, a separate matter um, you know I think I've heard enough to be convinced that it's worthwhile remanding this item back to the executive director to take a take a new look at all of the evidence available to them chasing down any um, um, you know, chasing down the allegations about misrepresentations and and lies, chasing down um, the insurance report, the insurance claim that uh, that um, that may claim a loss of fuel, which would suggest an actual release and so forth. Um, if there if there is a um, an enforcement action to be had with respect to the waste oil, um, you know, that may be a separate path. Perhaps it could be folded into this path. I don't know, but. Um, Certainly, staff could evaluate that on remand. So, I think bottom line for me is that we um, um, is that we send this back to them to to take a new look at it, recalculate penalties, and um, I think that's where I am. How's that sound? I, I'm fine with that. Okay. Um, again, Mr. Beard, Ms. Din, thank you for uh, for sharing your your comments and observations with us today. Um, those that that exhausts the folks who have um, signed in to speak on the enforcement docket this morning. And so next up we have um, OPIC. Mr. McWhorter, what are your thoughts? Um, with respect to the new items, uh, well, I, I support the remand of the order that you just uh, as you just acted on uh, the new items. I uh, recommend approval of those orders. Uh, uh, as well as old business item two, uh, I don't know if you're specifically interested in discussing further uh, the city of Laredo matter and whether the finding order was appropriate or not. I, uh, when this matter was last on the agenda, I, uh, you know, emphasized concern about future actions and how the compliance history might be used to uh, encourage the city to you know, take greater care in how it treats the citizens of South Laredo and ensures the safety of their drinking water. And I did sort of side skirted the issue of whether findings order was appropriate or not. Uh, and I, I still I have uh, deference for the ED's policies and the application of the findings criteria. And I understand the reasons why the order uh, for old business number one was processed the way it was. And, and could live with that. Uh, having gone back and looked at all of the record, including the proceedings from the last agenda, I, I was more and more having some of the same concerns, Chairman, that you were expressing about uh, regardless of how we typically apply that, whether when you look at the indifference to legal duty, whether you know the fact that TCEQ personnel were on hand uh, telling the city that they did need to issue boil water notices, whatever their interpretations of the regulations were, started looming bigger in my mind. And, and I started, uh, I've come to the conclusion that a findings order might be more appropriate for old business item one, um, but uh, I'd be satisfied with the order as issued as long as there was a commitment to monitoring and making sure that the city was really aware not just of its obligations regarding boil water notices, but uh, looking into the reasons why there seem to be so many boil water notices needed and why there seems to be such issues with the chlorine residuals and things of that nature. So those are my comments. Thank you, Mr. McWhorter. I appreciate that. Um, colleagues, I guess it's ours to discuss now. Um, and let's just take it from the top. Any any thoughts on old business one with respect to the comments we've heard today? Okay, I'll go. 
I'll go first. Um, and and I don't want to belabor this. Um, I reread the rules pertaining to the boil water notice, and and there's no ambiguity there. And and more to the point, these rules are meant to notify the public of a potential that their water is not safe to drink. This is not a post hoc notice that the water has been proven dangerous. At that point, it's really too late. And what concerns me is that the city is being cavalier about the health of its citizens. And I'm bothered, um, irritated might be a good word, that the city has chosen to try to parse its legal obligations, has given us a tortured reading of the authorities, all to avoid telling their citizens that they may be at risk. And that's simply not OK. Um, now, the legislature has limit our, limited our ability to exact larger penalties from public water supply systems. And uh, I'm not expressing an opinion about that policy choice, but I do want to acknowledge that, that it um, that it relates to our leverage as a as a regulator, and and specifically, our leverage is is limited. It has its limits. Um, so my hope is that the city will take a lesson from this experience, prioritize the health of its citizens, and not return to our enforcement docket. You know, I th certainly think it's appropriate, as Mr. McWhorter suggested, that that we um, enhance our our monitoring, our observation of of the city's operations. Um, and, you know, as to whether we send this back to make it a findings order or not, um, you know, I think I've been pretty clear about my findings. I'm concerned about this system. I'm concerned about um, the city's uh, um, approach to this, um, to this matter. Um, and so, you know whether whether we remand it or go forward with with this order. I'm ready to I'm ready to move forward with this order and get it done, but with the understanding that there's going to be more scrutiny and we expect the city to to learn its lesson. Um, and imperfect as it is, I you know I don't know that it serves a, a great deal um, of benefit to to send it back to put it in a different form. Um, the city understands where I am on, on this and. Um, I imagine y'all may be in a similar spot, but I will, those are my observations. Let me stop there and invite your, your comments. Commissioner Lindley. Um, I will, I will keep my comments pretty brief. I, th I think you stated everything um, very well, and I appreciate Vic's comments as well. I'll just say I'm in agreement. Um, I'm ready to move forward with the uh, proposed agreed order, adopting it. Um, I do think... Um, I don't always love continuing items, but I think in this situation it made sense. I would like to believe, and I and I do think the city of Laredo has probably heard our message loud and clear, and part of that's um, by the number of people that signed in today um, representing the city. Um, I was happy to see that. You know, I never had the intention of Laredo turning into a poster child for these kind of issues, but I would hope that other municipalities take note that we take drinking water, even potential violations, extremely serious. Um, so I too um, would would be okay today adopting um, the agreed order that's in front of us, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Commissioner Janeka? I, I think I'm in agreement with each of you. And uh, Chairman, I, I don't want to belabor or add to your, your words that captured it very, very well. Uh, it would certainly be more satisfying to be able to respond immediately to the, the pleas from the public that are coming today and, and have for the last two agendas. And, and I'm grateful for that, uh, for that action. I'm grateful for that, that signal of the public's interest and concerns about all the items on our agenda before us, but particularly this one. And I do hope that the city takes very seriously the question of how quickly and under what circumstances to respond uh, in future future situations where a boil water notice may be called for by our rules, but there may be another compelling explanation. I, I think we're all in agreement that that's not, not acceptable if there's potential public harm. Uh, notifying the public, trying to be more open and transparent is certainly the way that we would love to see all of our regulated entities try to err. Uh, but I, I 
did have, at the risk of belaboring this lengthy docket already, I, I had a question for Executive Director Staff that I did want to ask on item 22. Uh, so I don't want to shift gears. We were going from the top, but I'll, I'll hand it back to no, you. Go right ahead. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I did just, uh, turning to item 22 on the, on the enforcement docket, I noted that the assessed penalty is deferred to the minimum penalty the Executive Director can authorize in this matter due to a financial inability to pay. And considering the current status of that facility and the outstanding corrective actions, the estimated costs that our agency staff have, have given for those outstanding actions, it, it appears to me that an additional deferral under other factors as justice may require may be appropriate. And in, in making my decision, I, I wanted to ask ED staff if it would be helpful uh, or, or uh, I'm, I'm curious if you could comment on whether a further reduction would have a chilling effect on deterrence in this matter and the likelihood of coordinating with the respondent to get a, a signed revised order. I think both of those pieces would be important in my mind to, to try to answer that question. And so, Mr. Sinclair, could you or, or someone else for uh, the executive director just comment on uh, if, if we were to um, utilize our additional authority than the executive director does uh, does have and hold to, to push further that uh, other factors as justice may require adjustment and reserve the full amount of the respondents' resources to address to the corrective uh, actions and correcting the, the outstanding issues of the facility, uh, would, would that be a, a, a harmful outcome for, for our agencies? Uh, posture on deterrence of compliance and, and I'll just ask that question to you and, and ask if you might respond um, Commissioner this is, again, is Brian Sinclair um, the short answer to your question is I don't know it's a risk right um, I, I think that it's important to remember that these deferrals are conditional on compliance and so if, if, a, if, a, if a further reduction is, is made to essentially allow the, the respondent to utilize all those funds for, um, for coming into compliance, um, that could work. It would just, uh, but, but it would also mean that the, um, that the, that it's contingent on compliance, and maybe maybe the reduction would need to not just be in the, uh, in another factors. Uh, it may be better to put it in the deferral section and, and make it contingent along with the the other deferral on compliance. Uh, but that's that's my point of view. I think. I, I appreciate that, and, and that does answer uh, a good deal of the question in my mind. Uh, as to the uh, second question I had, do you, do you have anything to say either way in terms of the likelihood of, of coordinating with this respondent to get a signed revised order if uh, this, this matter were remanded back to uh, y'all to, to work up further in this direction? I, I do not have um, specific information on whether or not it would be likely to uh, or whether that would be difficult with this particular respondent or not but uh, if it's the, the desire of the Commission to, for us to pursue that we certainly can pursue that and uh, uh, if you remand it then we can go pursue that and see if uh, if um, if it's a change that that could help understood Thank you so much, Mr. Mr. Sinclair. I appreciate that. It answered my questions. Uh, and and I, I will just turn to, to my colleagues then and, and suggest that uh, I, I take seriously the, the requirements that our agency imposes in, in order for respondents to be able to assert and receive and downward adjustment on their, their penalty violation, their obligations uh, on the basis of having a financial inability to pay. And so I, I Take it, uh, take it well in hand that this respondent fully received all the credit that they possibly could for an inability to pay. And there are significant, uh, even in light of those, those adjusted amounts downward, there's still obligations that, that it appears to me I'm, I'm concerned that uh, funds are tight and I want to see them addressed to the right, right needs in the right places. And to that end, I would suggest to the two of y'all that it may be appropriate for us to be responsive and, and 
this level of granularity, particularly for these facilities where they fall into the space of the small business, the, the individual owners. I think that we've been uh, criticized by the public in the past or, or members of the, the press in the past for, for our agency. Stepping back, looking at the, uh, the data of our agency's regulatory enforcement uh, from a very myopic perspective, it looks like we really disproportionately hit and hit hard the underground petroleum storage tanks or the, the gas stations across our state relative to the more complex chemical facilities in terms of total dollars and, and penalty and, and impact on industry. And I would, I would just suggest that that's more a reflection of the differences in the natures of those industries and the, the matter of the violations. But I think that this, this example certainly falls into that space where if our agency is is susceptible to any criticism of, of those smaller entities, smaller actors in a different regulatory space being hit harder by our, our penalties and enforcement policy. This is exactly the sort of circumstance where I would hope we would have the, the flexibility to give relief. So I, I just put the question to you all and ask if you have any concerns, heartburn, or, or thoughts either way. So I have a few observations. Um, one is I think it's important for us to adhere to the penalty policy as much as possible. I think there's value in that or otherwise we're, you know, exercising, um, if, you know, if we, if we exercise the commission's jurisdiction to go outside the penalty too much, um, the, the penalty policy begins to become meaningless and I think we venture into territory where, where our actions become or can become um, or at least perceived to be arbitrary. Um, that said, um, I had flagged this one as well, Commissioner. I think it's a, it's a case of extraordinary hardship, and um, my thought was, was to uh, continue it, to take a closer, closer look at that. Um, you know, if you have a particular suggestion on, on uh, what to do on a remand, I'm, you know, certainly open to that, too, and, and um, I think what I understood Mr. Sinclair to say is, you know, one one way to approach this is to have the um, the remaining non-deferred penalty just wrapped in and added to the deferred portion of the penalty. That certainly makes sense to me if we were to remand it, or some portion of it anyway. Um, so let me get back to you as to what specifically you might propose, Commissioner Janeka, and invite Commissioner Lindley to, to chime in here. Um, I, I don't have too many comments. Um, I, I agree a lot, a, a lot with what you said, Chairman, and well, and Commissioner Janeka, you know, it, it is, um, it does make me nervous to stray away from the penalty policy just because um, uh, I view that as just, you know, it's, that's how we, that's how we're fair to everyone, even though it doesn't appear that way and, um, and can be difficult to explain to some folks. But, um, Meeting the financial inability to pay is uh, is difficult to do, and you know it seems like there was no question, from what I can gather at least, that um, this individual or this this entity definitely met that. And so there's obviously some pretty uh, you use the word extraordinary hardships there, and um, so I take that to heart as well. So I I do think continuing it. Um, I will say, you know, this this could change, but I, my knee-jerk reaction is that um, I think some sort of penalty needs to be applied, um, but I think there probably are some creative ways how we can get there. So I'll stop there. Well, if, if I might respond, uh, Commissioner Lindley, I, I think that I'm certainly in agreement with the spirit of, of your observation there, and, and I think that uh, turning back to your question, Chairman, in, in terms of my, my thoughts on a path moving, moving forward, I would I would suggest uh, we may we may consider a remand to the executive director with the uh, suggestion that they they consider exactly what what Mr. Sinclair suggested in terms of uh, adjusting that outstanding. Uh, penalty obligation to, to include it as a deferred uh, penalty in such a way as if the uh, respondent cannot make the corrective actions, demonstrate that all the necessary costs and, and resources are dedicated to making those corrective actions to our agency's satisfaction, then uh, all of those deferred amounts would, would potentially come due or, or partially or fully uh, as, as our uh, agency's legal authority can then assert further down that compliance process. Um, 
I, I, I certainly take the point that there's there's a, a need and a desire to see them pay some penalty, and I, I think that it falls very much in the same space in my mind in how we have been granted the authority relatively recently by the legislature uh, in, in terms of granting flexibility to cities or, or public authorities to utilize in lieu of paying penalties to us, or the state rather, uh, apply those funds directly to, to remediation. I think that the, the public is served in this instance in the same sense that, that we, we respond to the legislature's good policy direction in that, in that other space. Uh, but I will uh, turn and yeah, see, see where you're at, Chairman. You know, I think where I am at is, you know, let's just slow down here. Give, I would like a chance just to, you know, look at all the facts again, you know, consider carefully what I think is appropriate. You know, I think, um, I think this may be headed towards a remand, but I don't, there's no urgency to that on this order that I see. Um, I think if we do remand it, we should be very clear in directing the executive director what we want the executive director to do with it and not ask them to consider or exercise discretion that really belongs with us, not with, not with staff. So I think, um, if you don't mind, I know we don't like continuing things, I don't either, but maybe maybe just slow the roll on this one a little bit, continue it, gather all the facts, and then come back with some crisp, clear instructions for the executive director, if that's all right with, with y'all. I'd be fine continuing it. Likewise. Okay. All right, so um, I think we've talked about all of, the, all of the thorny ones on the enforcement docket. Um, we've heard from all the parties, any other Thoughts on the enforcement docket and all all attempt a motion. That's fine. I have no questions. All right. Um, listen carefully and correct me when I get this wrong. Um, colleagues, I move that we adopt old business items one and two, and new business items twenty one. I'm sorry, and new business items five through twenty one, and twenty four through thirty, as recommended today by the executive director and that we continue item 22 until a further agenda and that we remand item 23 to reconsider the penalty consistent with the conversation from the dais today. Does that work, Ms. Smith? Yes. Okay, I've made my motion. Is there a second? I'll second. The motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 The motion carries. Ms. Chairman, oh, yes, go ahead. For a two three minute break real quick yes we have um, the time is 10 42 we'll take a short recess and reconvene at approximately 10 45 we stand in recess
All right, we're back in session after a short break. The time's 1046, and Ms. Smith, I'll ask you to call the next item. Item number 31 is the consideration of the monthly enforcement report. The executive director's staff is here to present these matters. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman, Commissioners, General Counsel, and Public Interest Counsel. My name is Melissa Cordell of the Enforcement Division, and with me is Brian Sinclair of the Enforcement Division and Charmaine Backens of the Litigation Division. We are here to present the monthly enforcement report for fiscal year 2021 through April. There were 614 effective administrative orders issued, and of those, 83 contained supplemental environmental projects. These orders assessed a total of $6,710,027 in penalties with a payable amount of $4,171,650. $1,393,421 are to be paid towards supplemental environmental projects. 10,350 notices of violation have been issued through either our field offices or review of self-reported data in our central office. 1,166 enforcement action referrals have been received. There are 1,683 pending administrative orders with 273 cases that are on the backlog. 207 cases are pending at the Attorney General's Office for Representation in District Court and 10 judgments have been issued. 2,056 cases are being tracked for compliance. We've included for review a summary of OCE investigative activities for fiscal years 2019, 20, and 21. We are available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Cordell. I have none. Commissioner Lindley, any questions? No questions, thanks. Commissioner Janeka? None, thank you. All right. No one signed in to speak on this. Mr. McWhorter, what are your thoughts? I don't have any questions. I appreciate the report. Thank you. Likewise, Ms. Cordell, thank you and your team for the report. No action is necessary on this item. So, um, colleagues, if there's nothing else, seeing nothing, Ms. Smith, I'll ask you to please call the next item. Item number 32 is the consideration of a petition for rulemaking filed by Perales, Allman, and Ice, PC, on behalf of Ingleside on the Bay Coastal Watch Association, the Port Aransas Conservancy, and Hillcrest Residents Association to amend 30 Texas Administrative Code chapters 295 and 297 to prescribe measures to minimize impingement and entrainment at desalinization facilities. The petitioners Ingleside on the Bay Coastal Watch, Port Aransas Conservancy, and Hillcrest Residents Association are represented by Eric Allman, and they will present the matter, followed by other interested persons, the ED and OPIC. The General Counsel's Office recommends limiting the speakers to five minutes each for presentations. Good morning, Mr. Allman. Please go ahead, identify yourself for the record, and the floor is yours, sir. Yes, good morning, Chairman, Commissioners, General Counsel, and Public Interest Counsel. My name is Eric Allman. I'm here on behalf of Ingleside on the Bay Coastal Watch Association. Ingleside on the Bay Coastal Watch Association is an organization of residents and landowners near Ingleside on the Bay where the future development of desalination projects threatens the biological integrity of nearby areas of Corpus Christi Bay and the local economy dependent on a healthy bay ecosystem. Over the next several years, TCQ will likely be considering several applications for large water rights permits associated with seawater desalination facilities. Impingement and entrainment is a major environmental impact of these intakes. The legislature has made a policy charge that intakes for such facilities are subject to heightened levels of prescriptive specificity. In order to provide for efficient and consistent processing of these applications, petitioners asked TC to initiate a rulemaking to establish the appropriate measures to minimize impingement and entrainment occurring as a result of such facilities. Ingleside on the Bay Coastal Watch Association would have no objection to a role limited to seawater desalination facilities. Many of the executive director's criticisms of the petition go to the content of the proposed rules. Those criticisms are issues that can and should be considered during the rulemaking. But the decision before the commission today is only whether to engage in a rulemaking to prescribe reasonable measures to minimize impingement and entrainment not a decision on what those rules should say. The decision of whether to engage in a rulemaking can be resolved by looking to the plain language of the governing statute and the plain language of the TCQ rules. Texas Water Code Section 18.03H is straightforward and explicitly states the commission by rule shall prescribe reasonable measures to minimize impingement and entrainment. By requiring that the commission prescribe reasonable measures, 
the legislature has explicitly required the TCQ adopt a prescriptive regulatory approach to the minimization of impingement and entrainment as a result of intakes for desalination facilities. TCQ rules at 295.302 and 297.209 relied upon by the executive director do not identify particular measures that would minimize impingement and entrainment. For example, an applicant is asked to identify the maximum through screen velocity, but no velocity to minimize impingement and entrainment is prescribed. By failing to prescribe reasonable measures to minimize impingement and entrainment, those rules are not sufficient to implement the requirements of House Bill 2031. The adoption of rules identifying measures to minimize impingement and entrainment prescriptively does not require an inflexible approach. The impacts of desalination facilities are highly dependent upon location. That's reflected in the recent report by the Texas Parson Wildlife Department and the General Land Office. An intake would have virtually no ecological impact offshore, could be devastating if placed within a bay or estuary. Seawater desalinization can be done without excessive harm to the environment if done properly at appropriate locations, and proper rules can acknowledge this. I thank you, and I'm available for any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Allman. Um, I have none. Commissioner Lindley, any questions? No. Commissioner Janaka. None, thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. We have one person signed in to, to speak on this. Ms. Gaines, are you with us? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Please go ahead and identify yourself and your affiliation, and the floor is yours. Good morning, Commissioners. My name is Erin Gaines. I'm here today representing the Hillcrest Residents Association, or HRA. This is one of the other groups that filed this rulemaking petition. HRA is a group formed to protect the public health, safety, the environment, and the quality of life for residents in the Hillcrest neighborhood of Corpus Christi. Hillcrest is a historically segregated African-American neighborhood along Corpus Christi's north side, or the Refinery Row, where current residents are surrounded by two refineries, the Ship Channel, Highway I-37, and the new Harbor Bridge. Now Hillcrest residents face yet another proposed facility in their neighborhood, a desalination plant along Corpus Christi's Inner Harbor. The Inner Harbor connects to the Corpus Christi Bay, an environmentally sensitive ecosystem that is important for tourism and commercial and recreational fisheries. This is one of several applications for desalination plants in the Corpus Christi Bay pending before TCEQ. Desalination facilities intake large amounts of seawater to convert to fresh water by reverse osmosis. Aquatic organisms are often trapped against intake screens or sucked into the facility itself, which is called impingement or entrainment. We're here today to discuss the petition that HRA and other Costa Bend groups filed with TCEQ to adopt regulations governing intake structures for these seawater desalination facilities. This petition is critical to ensure efficient and consistent standards in the review of these applications. Importantly, as Mr. Allman said, the Texas legislature in 2015 required TCQ to prescribe reasonable measures to minimize impingement and entrainment in recognition that these desalination permits would present common issues and it made sense to set a common standard by rule. The advantage to establishing these common standards for impingement and entrainment is that it promotes consistency and enables the impacted public to participate in this process through a single rulemaking rather than having to inefficiently deal with the issue through repeated participation in multiple permit applications. This is particularly important for small community groups with limited resources like HRA, especially in environmental justice communities. The proposed rules would establish minimum standards for design of intake structures and a framework for enhanced scrutiny where important sport and commercial fisheries would be impacted. However, the specifics of the rules do not need to be decided at this stage. They can and be, should be considered during a public rulemaking. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Gaines. Um, let's hear, colleagues, any questions for Mr. Allman or Ms. Gaines? No, thank you. Okay. Um, let's hear next from the executive director. Good morning, commissioners, general counsel, and public interest counsel. On behalf of the Executive Director, I'm Dr. Kathy Alexander with the Water Availability Division. With me today is Ruth Takeda with the Environmental Law Division. 
This petition for rulemaking was submitted by attorneys representing the petitioners, Ingleside on the Bay Coastal Watch Association, Port Aransas Conservancy, and Hillcrest Residents Association. The petitioners state that the commission has not adopted rules as required by Texas Water Code Section 18.003H, and therefore requests that the commission initiate rulemaking to amend chapters 295 and 297. Specifically, the petitioners propose new rules regarding the application requirements for a desalination intake and prescribing measures to minimize impingement and entrainment at desalination facilities. The executive director recommends denying the petition because the commission has adopted rules addressing impingement and entrainment pursuant to Texas Water Code Section 18.003H, and the petitioner's proposed rules extend beyond the scope of those adopted rules. In addition, the Commission's existing rules governing water rights applications under Chapter 11, including the authority to require special conditions to address impingement and entrainment, are sufficient. Thank you, and we're available to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Alexander. I have none. Colleagues, any questions for Dr. Alexander? Seeing none, Mr. McWhorter, what are your thoughts? Uh, actually, uh, for OPIC, Eli Martinez, I believe, is on the line, and he'll give our presentation. Great. Good morning, Mr. Martinez. Good morning, Chairman. Um, OPIC has reviewed this petition and its reference materials, and we support granting the petition and initiating the rulemaking process to seek further stakeholder input on developing more protective rules. Because multiple desalination facilities are currently under consideration that would potentially impact sensitive ecological, recreational, and commercial areas, the agency is confronted with an important moment in time relating to the location, construction, and operation of these facilities, including implementation of protective measures for sensitive marine sea life. OPIC respectfully submits that TCEQ's mission to protect the environment, economy, and sensitive ecology in our state's estuaries, bays, and passes places an increasingly urgent and consequential obligation on the agency to fully study, analyze, and regulate how these facilities will be constructed so as to achieve sensible balance between economic feasibility and environmental protection. Measures needed to protect marine organisms when diverting seawater in the Gulf are identified in the Texas Parks and Wildlife and GLO Zone Study. While the study was commissioned by HB 2031 as part of the Chapter 18 expedited review process, the underlying science may be extrapolated to marine seawater extraction under the other chapters of the water code. Further, the study is a single proof point in a larger body of science that is increasingly recognizing the special considerations that must occur when placing intake structures in environmentally sensitive bays, estuaries, and passes. The proposed rulemaking embraces such considerations and initiates an important conversation about how to best effectuate those measures. While the proposed rulemaking borrows heavily from rules applicable to cooling water intake structures, the environmental impact of desalination facilities on marine organisms in our bays, estuaries, and passes is as consequential as those impacts are in the context of cooling water intake structures. OPEC, therefore, supports initiating a rulemaking process to consider how marine life may be protected for desalination projects as well as they are in other par permitting processes. As the petition illustrates, the current rules do not sufficiently prescribe specific reasonable measures to prevent impingement and entrainment in marine seawater sea intakes utilized by desalination facilities. OPIC supports granting the petition and seeking further stakeholder input so that more protective approaches may be considered. Thank you, and I'm available for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Martinez. I have none. Commissioner Lindley, any questions? Commissioner Janeka? No, thank you. Okay. Um, well, colleagues, here's, here's where I am on this. Um, the petition is premised on the idea that we, don't, um, that we don't have reasonable measures in place, you know, that perhaps we even uh, failed to discharge our duty under House Bill 2031 to, um, to adopt reasonable measures. Um, what, what House Bill 2031 does is it provides an alternative procedure under Chapter 18 of the Water Code for authorizing diversions of marine seawater for desalination. And it, you know, it, as, as I mentioned, or as was suggested, it directs the commission to adopt rules addressing impingement and entrainment for chapter 18 authorizations. And we did that in 2016. Um, House Bill 2031 does not affect the diversion of seawater under chapter 11. So 
Um, so we've met our obligations under House Bill 2031. Um, but to be clear, the agency also regulates impingement and entrainment under Chapter 11 authorizations. So in my view, the, um, the proposed new rules, you know, whatever form they might take, are not necessary. I think we have this covered already. So that's how I'm viewing it. What do you think, Commissioner Lindley? Um, I thought that was a great explanation. I, um, I would be supportive of denying the petition. What's in front of us today? Commissioner Janeka? Uh, I think I, I reached the same conclusion with, with just the added caveat that I, I think OPEC, in, in their comment today, touched on many of the same points that gave me some hesitancy in reaching with and agreeing with that, that uh, logical finding. But uh, I'll, I'll merely just observe and, and encourage ED staff to uh, take, take serious consideration over anything that, that the uh, petition may have called for or spoken to, particularly where OPEC acknowledges the the growing attention and, and growing body of science in this space. Uh, aside from that, I, I think it's a rare circumstance where there is a, a good, compelling reason for denial for this petition. Thank you. I think we're ready for a motion. I have that here. I would move that we deny the petition for rulemaking filed by Perales, Almond, and Ice on behalf of Ingleside on the Bay Coastal Watch Association, Port Aransas Conservancy, and Hillcrest Residents Association because the Commission's existing rules on impingement and entrainment at desalination facilities under Texas Water Code Chapter 18 are sufficient, and the proposed new rules under Texas Water Code Chapter 11 are unnecessary. A second. The motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 The motion carries. Ms. Smith, please call the next item. Okay. Item 33 is the consideration of the adoption of new and amended sections of 30 Texas Administrative Code, Chapter 115, regarding control of air pollution from volatile organic compounds and corresponding revisions to the state implementation plan. The Executive Director's staff is here to present this item. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioners, General Counsel, and Public Interest Counsel. On behalf of the Executive Director, I am Nikki Clark with the Air Quality Division. With me is Amy Browning with the Environmental Law Division. For your consideration today are the Executive Director's revisions to 30 Texas Administrative Code Chapter 115. The revisions would implement reasonably available control technology to address the United States Environmental Protection Agency's control techniques guidelines for the oil and natural gas industry and the Dallas-Fort Worth and Houston-Galveston Brazoria ozone non-attainment areas for the 2008 eight-hour ozone national ambient air quality standard. Staff respectfully requests adoption of the Chapter 115 rulemaking. Staff also respectfully requests permission to make non-substantive revisions to comply with Texas Register requirements. Thank you, and we are available to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Clark. I have none. Commissioner Lindley, any questions? No questions, thanks. Commissioner Janeka. No, thank you. All right. We have at least one person signed in. Um, Mr. Cyrus Reed, are you with us? I can't hear you. Might double check your your mute button. Yeah, can you hear me now? I, I can now. Good, good, good to hear you, Mr. Okay. Reed. Thank um, you. Please uh, go ahead and identify yourself for the record, and and the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you for the record. My name is Cyrus Reed, uh, Lone Star Chapter of the Sierra Club. Um, here to address uh, item 33. Good morning, uh, commissioners, general counsel, public interest counsel. Um, I actually wanted to make two points. The first was to thank um, your staff uh, on this rulemaking um, for two things. One, for extending the comment period time. You know, it, it's been difficult, obviously, with uh, uh, with COVID and everything happening. Um, uh, and, and we very much appreciated the extra time that was given on this rulemaking. Um, and second was, I thought you, your staff did a, an excellent job in responding to the comments from the Sierra Club, from Environmental Defense Fund, and from EPA, and for making some, I think, improvements in the rule based on those comments. Obviously, there were some comments we made that you did not agree with, and we would have liked uh, you know, a different outcome, but I do very much appreciate the professionalism 
um, of your staff and, and the way they laid out their, their rationale. And the second point, given that I think it's unlikely that you're going to uh, agree to the comments that we already made um, and make a change today, I did want to um, uh, give you the knowledge that there are going to be actions uh, coming from the federal government on these issues. And I want to make sure that the commission is aware of these and may want to consider you know, opening up conversations with stakeholders in Texas about them sooner rather than later. Um, and the first thing I'll say is, as you know, EPA is actively looking at the uh, reconsider reconsidering the ozone non-attainment areas such that El Paso uh, may be considered a non-attainment for ozone as well, which is a, an action we, you know, we, we do support at the Sierra Club. Um, and that may mean some of these control guidance te technologies could also apply to the El Paso area. Um, you know, there's an ongoing discussion about uh, San Antonio uh, ozone non-attainment area as well. So I wanted to make sure you're aware of that. And the second thing I wanted you to be aware of is Congress last week did um, uh, uh, pass a Congressional Review Act on the methane rules. Now, this, this particular rulemaking is only dealing with VOCs, but as we argued in our comments, it makes sense to also be looking at methane and at the same time you look at VOC control technology. So you, I wanted you to be aware that Congress is reinstating some of those rules that were, in our view, rolled back under the Trump administration. And I, I would think you wouldn't be surprised that we expect President Biden to sign those so that may, there may be a need for a further action um, from your staff to implement those, you know, the rules from before that were rolled back, which are, are now there again. And we also fully expect the EPA to do a, a wider look at methane standards for not just the, new, the newer oil and well facilities, but the existing infrastructure as well. So I, I really just wanted to use this, this time not to urge you to do anything specific on the item before you, but urge your staff to be prepared and perhaps open up some stakeholder uh, dialogue on this so that Texas can get ahead of these regulations and do something in a way that, you know, is common sense, but also will lead to reductions in both um, emissions that cause ozone problems, but also emissions that in our view are, are cooking the climate because of their uh, their global warming um, impacts. And so that, with that, I just, I do appreciate very much uh, the, the attention your staff put into responding to comments and the added time for the um, for making comments. And with that, I'll close. Thank you, Mr. Reed. Um, I have a number of thoughts in, re in response to your comments. One was, I you know, um, you know, we 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 try to mind our ethics here. So I was uh, uh, and and our um, open government laws. So in, in listening to your comments, I was thinking. Is he straying outside the matter that's been noticed before us? And uh, what it what it reminded me is that when you're talking about air, a it's complex, and b everything is is interconnected. I mean, VOCs uh, clearly have a direct uh, relationship to, to ozone. Um, so I, I just wanted to 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 note and reflect on just the complexity and, and interrelatedness of all this. I also wanted to thank you for um, recognizing the professionalism of our staff. Our, our staff is outstanding. They do a great job. Um, and I, thank you for recognizing that. And I, and I appreciate that it can be difficult to recognize that when you uh, have some substantive disagreements with them. But, but the fact that you're able to recognize that makes it a lot easier for us all to get together, even where we, when we have different viewpoints, and actually hear from our stakeholders and get to the meat of the issues um, instead of having it drowned out in, in you know, uh, more, less constructive conversations. So um, I, I thank you for that. Um, I don't think I have any other uh, responses for you right now, but uh, colleagues, any questions or comments for Mr. Reed? Thank you for the the updates and news about coming federal actions. I'm sure our staff will will be ready to uh, respond and, and consider those when when they come down the pike. But I, I certainly appreciate the spirit of wanting to uh, come to the table earlier to discuss these issues where there are outstanding issues ahead. So thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Reed. Uh, no one else has signed in to speak, so we'll hear next from OPIC. OPIC recommends approval for adoption of the new and amended sections of the Commission's Chapter 115 rules and corresponding revisions to the state implementation plan as presented by the Executive Director. Thank you, Mr. McWhorter. I agree with that. This action is necessary to meet our SIP obligations. I think it's pretty straightforward. Um, so I think I'm ready to move forward with adoption. I am too. And I would move that we adopt the new and amended sections of 30 um, Texas Administrative Code Chapter 115 and the corresponding revisions to the state implementation plan as recommended by the executive director. I second the motion. The motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 The motion carries. Ms. Smith, please call the next item. Item number 34 is the consideration of an air quality standard permit for marine loading operations under Texas Health and Safety Code Chapter 382. The Executive Director's staff is here to present the item. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioners, General Counsel, and Public Interest Counsel. On behalf of the Executive Director, I am Melanie Nealon with the Air Permits Division. With me is Sierra Redding with the Environmental Law Division. For your consideration today is the adoption of a new non-rural non air quality standard permit for marine loading operations or MLO authorized under the Texas Health and Safety Code section 382.05195 and Title 30 Texas Administrative Code chapter 116 subchapter F. The new standard permit will offer applicants more flexibility when seeking authorization of MLO facilities. Notice of the draft permit was published in the Texas Register on December 18, 2020. The, a public meeting was held on January 21, 2021, and the pu public comment period ended at midnight on January 22, 2021. Based on comments, the team made the following substantive changes. Limited recent service and record keeping to trucks that are loaded while in residue service after last being unloaded. Allowed alternative methods of roof inspections. Excluded heated storage tanks from certain requirements. Clarified that vapor space concentration sampling is only required if hydrogen sulfide emissions are estimated using vapor space concentration in the registration. Corrected averaging times for boiler and heater, nitrogen oxide and carbon monoxide emission limits, and included various minor corrections and clarifications to technical requirements and terminology. Additionally, staff request authorization to make other corrections and clarifications and non-substantive non revisions necessary to comply with Texas Register requirements. In conclusion, staff respectfully recommends adoption of this standard permit. Thank you. We are available to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Nealon. I have none. Commissioner Lindley, any questions? Seeing none. Commissioner Janeka. All right, we have no one signed in to speak on this. So, Mr. McWhorter, what are your thoughts? My office reviewed this uh, standard permit. We offer no objection to adopting it. Thank you, Mr. McWhorter. So, colleagues, the point of the standard permit is to provide greater transparency and efficiency with respect to permitting, compliance, and enforcement activities for marine loading operations or MLOs that have, to this point, been authorized by stacking um, multiple permits by rule or PBRs. So new MLOs would have to be authorized either through this new standard permit or through the existing individual case-by-case -case NSR permit. Um, this does not affect individual permits or, or the ability to use PBRs to make minor modifications to an individual permit nor does it affect existing MLOs that are authorized solely by PBRs unless they need to make a modification, in which case they would have to come in either for the standard permit or, um, or use the individual permit. The standard permit requires best available control technology. It's supported by an appropriate protectiveness review, and um, the agency has met the, the legal notice requirements um, 
for, for adoption of the standard permit. In fact, the agency has provided more notice than is legally required. So I'm inclined to, to move forward with adoption. Commissioner Lindley, what are your thoughts? As am I, I appreciate all the work that um, staff put into this. Um, very technical, <laughs> but I'm, I'm for adopting it. Thank you, Commissioner Janeka. Well, well summarized, uh, well captured, Chairman. And I, I would only add the observation that well, I agree with you that the agency went above and beyond its, its obligations on notice requirements on this one. I, I do note that there were requests from the public and, and we made the decision not to offer a translation of the, of the initial notice on this, on this matter. I, I hope that that's a skill set that our agency develops and grows so that that's an easier threshold decision for us to make in future standard permit actions like this where there's uh, no geographical location necessarily where something may take place. That strikes me as a great place where our agency can try to uh, err on the side of caution and, and offer translations if, if there are uh, limited English communities where, where these permitted sites could be, could be located. I think there's a really compelling argument that we need to consider strongly uh, translating. That said, I, I do want to recognize and again reiterate, we went above and beyond what, what rules require for these standard permits and, and I'm perfectly satisfied ready to move forward today. Great. Thank you. I think we're ready for a motion. I'll move that we adopt the air quality standard permit for marine loading operations as recommended by the executive director. I second. The motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 The motion carries. Ms. Smith, please call the next item. Item 35 is the adoption of the 2021 Regional Hayes State Implementation Plan Revision. The executive director staff is here to present the item. Good morning. Good morning, commissioners, general counsel, and public interest counsel. On behalf of the executive director, I'm Walker Williamson of the Air Quality Division. I'm joined by John Minter of the Environmental Law Division. For your consideration today is the executive director's revision to the state implementation plan, or SIP, for, regional, for the regional Hayes second planning period. This SIP revision addresses regional Hayes in Big Bend and Guadalupe Mountains National Parks in Texas and class one areas located outside Texas that may be affected by emissions from within the state in accordance with Federal Clean Air Act Section 169A. Staff respectfully requests adoption of this SIP revision. Thank you for your consideration and we're available to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Williamson. I have none. Commissioner Lindley, any questions? No questions, thanks. Commissioner Janeka? None. Great. We do have a few people signed in to speak on this item. Um, let's begin with Professor Daniel Cohen. And, and sir, when you're ready, uh, thank if you'll, you, yeah, you're, you're coming in loud and clear. Please just go ahead and identify yourself for the record, and then the floor is yours, sir. Sure. Um, <clears throat> yeah, my name is Daniel Cohen. I'm an atmospheric scientist and associate professor of environmental engineering at Rice University with two decades of experience working on modeling and analysis of air pollution issues. Uh, this regional haze rule is of particular interest to me because before joining Rice and returning to Texas, I worked for Georgia's environmental agency, the Environmental Protection Division, where I worked with uh, not just Georgia, but with neighboring states across uh, the Southeast and the Southern Appalachians uh, to develop the first phase regional haze plan for Texas and, and collaborate as other states did so as well. So I realize um, the challenge and, and great work that the agency staff did and, and the outstanding modelers and analysts that are there who, who looked at the data and, and wrote a very thorough report in terms of uh, the impacts of haze and, and, and the causes at, at Big Bend and other class one areas. At the same time, that makes me um, all the more astounded to see that the proposal is to take absolutely no action for new control measures for the next decade. In fact, this plan would never have been accepted by Georgia or any of the neighboring states when we were developing our first phase of plans and we uh, required best available retrofit technologies to be installed at sources that have been grandfathered in, including uh, what's happening in Texas where there are uh, coal-fired power plants emitting more uh, sulfur and nitrogen oxide pollution than in any other state and to lack scrubbers that have been required of all new power plants since around 1981. And this plan by doing nothing would allow that to continue. Uh, the proposed plan would do nothing to reduce emissions of haze forming air pollution from Texas power plants and industries 
for another decade to come, even though the purpose of the regional Hayes rule is to put us on a continued glide path of continual further progress and a move towards natural visibility at uh, class one areas. Although the rule is targeted at regional Hayes, the same pollutant that causes haze, fine particulate matter, is also what scientists tell us is the deadliest air pollutant, required, uh, responsible for several million deaths a year globally and tens of thousands in the United States. Uh, my own research, published in the Journal of the Air and Waste Management Association, has shown that the Texas coal power plants that are left uncontrolled by this rule contribute to the deaths of several hundred Texans every year. Uh, TCEQ's own analysis uh, shows that there are numerous control measures that could reduce nitrogen oxides and sulfur dioxide emissions for less than the cost effectiveness threshold they chose, which was $5,000 per ton. I would argue they should have chosen an even higher threshold because our analysis and numerous published papers show that SO2 controls are uh, beneficial to health even at ten dollars to $20,000 per ton. But even taking into account the $5,000 per ton uh, threshold, TCQ identified numerous measures that could be put in place uh, that would achieve that and be far more cost effective than that threshold and have been decades overdue in being imposed, and yet none of them are proposed. The rationale is that by doing them collectively, they would not be perceptible to the human eye, which is a standard that I've never heard used, just like we control greenhouse gases, even if we can't feel how much hotter it would be with them. We control air pollutants and ozone smog, even if we don't feel them searing our lungs. Here, we uh, got analysis showing that these are contributing to haze at Big Bend, at Guadalupe Mountains, uh, at uh, class one areas in New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Arkansas, and yet we're choosing to do nothing about them. And the analysis that, that TCQ has put forward is consistent with the group, uh, with what my group published in Strasford et al. 2018, showing that indeed these plants, including uh, Plant Parish in my own backyard and in Fort Bend County, uh, contribute to haze at those class one areas. Um, by do, adopting a do-nothing plan, TCQ is almost certain to attract lawsuits and see this plan rejected by the EPA, much like EPA rejected the previous uh, plan um, uh, under phase one. I urge the commission to ask uh, the executive director and, and the the highly qualified staff to revise this plan to include options for control measures that have already identified to be cost effective, as well as measures that should have been considered, such as scrubbers at Plant Parish. Although the air quality improvements may not be perceptible to the human eye, doing nothing is missing cost effective opportunities to reduce haze and control particulate matter, potentially saving hundreds of lives. And I appreciate you for, for your time and, and giving me this opportunity to speak. Thank you, Professor Cohan. Um, appreciate uh, your comments this morning. Uh, next up, we're, we'll hear from Chloe Crumley. Ms. Crumley, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Good morning. Just go ahead and please identify yourself for the record, and the floor is yours. Wonderful. Uh, good morning, Chairman and Commissioners. My name is Chloe Crumley with the Texas and Oklahoma Office of the National Parks Conservation Association a 100-year-old nonpartisan organization that works to protect our national parks for current and future generations. Thank you for the opportunity to comment today regarding item 35. Um, I'd also like to thank the staff that worked on this plan. Everyone was accessible and responded to us in a timely manner when we had questions and granted us an extended comment period, which we were able to take advantage of. While we previously submitted comments about the revised plan um, and we appreciate the team taking those comments into consideration, we want to go ahead and uh, raise more concerns um, for the record before you vote on the state implementation plan. The Clean Airs Act Regional Haze Rule is an opportunity for Texas to create a robust state implementation plan in the clean air of harmful pollutants that travel in and outside of Texas, like Mexico and Oklahoma. Um, yet the plan has fallen short for the last 10 years and the plan before you still fails to incorporate those adequate controls and measures on some of our state's largest polluting facilities. And this is our main concern. So along with our 1.6 million members and supporters, I encourage you to not approve the state's regional haze plan until it inquires about requirements for significant pollution reduction from those industrial and cold fired facilities contained in it. And that would make reasonable progress in clearing the air over our national parks and class one areas, but would also benefit the economy and the health of Texans at the same time. So let me give you some examples. If you get out to the national parks this summer, um, like I, I hope you do, to go see the Milky Way at the Big Bend or climb the peak of Guadalupe Mountains, 
there's a good chance you'll miss out on about 50 miles of scenery. I and mean, then that impacts the visitor experience. So if haze imp negatively impacts the visitor experience, that can hurt local economies that depend on park tourism like Fort Davis and Marathon. Parks provide nearly $480 million in economic output in Texas annually and support thousands of jobs. But studies show that park visitation drops when air pollution is high, indicating the direct effect of air quality has on the visitor experience and potential impact on tourism dollars. We're also concerned that without adequate pollution controls on facilities like Martin Lake Electrical Station, which could fill over 200 football stadiums annually with its emissions, not only will the park suffer, but the health of Texans. In fact, haze pollution has the most harmful consequences for people of color and socioeconomically disadvantaged communities. And these realities are especially troubling as marginalized communities are bearing the brunt of air pollution and have had the highest COVID-19 infection rates during our ongoing pandemic. So without strong safeguards protecting the air we breathe, we cannot keep our parks and local economies healthy, let alone people. Lastly, the regional haze rule is a time-tested and effective program to clean the air and assist in ensured closure of plants like Harrington that has agreed to convert by 2025, but this unenforceable agreement is concerning and could be addressed by a stronger SIP. The chairman and commissioners, uh, we ask that you help Texas commit to a new, uh, stronger plan. And Texans want you to take action for cleaner air. So earlier this week, we submitted to your office a petition signed by more than 350 Texans asking for you to take action to clean the air of our national parks, protect wildlife, and provide great benefits to the health of our communities by not accepting the plan and requiring stronger pollution controls. So thank you for listening to our concerns and for your consideration on this. Thank you, Ms. Crumbly. Um, we appreciate you sharing your comments with us. And uh, next up, we're gonna hear from uh, Cyrus Reed again. And uh, again, Mr. Reed, if you'll just identify yourself uh, for the record and then proceed. Yes, um, Cyrus Reed, Lone Star Chapter of the Sierra Club. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Um, General Counsel OPIC and and anyone else listening, um, I'll, I'll be very brief. Given that a number of the points I was going to make were made by the previous two speakers, but I am going to echo the comment and ask you to reject this proposed plan. Uh, we really have a opportunity to make progress in improving uh, air quality, especially in our national parks, that will benefit everyone in Texas and in nearby states. Um, and this proposed plan really is disappointing and falls short in meeting requirements of the Clean Air Act. Um, it doesn't require any emission reduction. It ignores a number of polluting sources um, and doesn't recognize the full extent of national parks and wilderness areas uh, that will be harmed um, if you don't change this plan. And so let me, I, I'm not going to go and read my whole statement, given that a number of the points were, were made, but I did want to emphasize that the plan before you um, does consider some of the major sources uh, that contribute to haze, sort of the big electric generating units, uh, but then fails to actually require them to do anything. Um, but it does, based on some other analysis that have been submitted, we believe there are a number of other sources that should have been considered. Uh, and I refer mainly to uh, oil and gas production, particularly in West Texas, that is ignored in this plan, and we know, based upon studies, does contribute to regional haze. And so I, I'm not going to reiterate the points that were made before on the coal plants and the lack of control technology and why that damages um, visibility in the parks, but also has uh, severe impacts on health uh, throughout Texas. But I also want to point out that there are a large number of other large sources that are not addressed in this plan uh, and in our comments uh, that we submitted earlier this year, we, we went into some detail on those on those sources. But again, uh, we, we view this as a do nothing plan. We urge you to reject it. And we think if you do submit it, uh, it's, it's likely to be rejected um, by the current EP anyway, which means we're wasting a lot of time staff uh, staff time um, and and a lot of hours of work, and so we think it would be better to reject it and come back with a different plan that that the EPA might be able to act upon in in a in a positive way. So with that, I'll end my comments. Thank you, Mr. Reed. Appreciate your comments, uh, colleagues. Any questions or comments before we hear from OPIC? No, thank you. All right, 
Mr. McWhorter, what are your thoughts? Um, as evidenced by the backup materials and the discussion today, there's significant disagreement whether new emission control measures for identified sources should be included in this SIP provision. OPIC is not staffed with subject matter experts who can evaluate the technical bases underpinning the position taken in the comments and the response to comments. But we do understand the significance of the July 31st deadline and the need to submit a SIP revision for EPA's review by that time. For this reason, we have no objection to approval of this item, so the SIP revision may be timely submitted for EPA's review and response. Thank you, Mr. McWhorter. You know, Colleagues, I think what we have here is just a fundamental different, different view of what this provision of the Clean Air Act is, is about. And the way I look at it, 169A is about visibility. It's an aesthetic standard. You know, the Federal Clean Air Act uh, is principally a statute about protecting public health and the environment, and we're very familiar with those provisions. Um, but separate from those provisions, Congress chose to regulate for aesthetic values. And um, they've done so specifically um, addressing visibility with the goal of improving visibility in national parks and other class one areas. Um, and in fact, Congress directed EPA to adopt regulations to put states on a path to achieving so-called natural visibility. And th the states demonstrate that they're making reasonable progress toward that goal, toward better visibility through their regional haze state implementation plans. And that's what's before us today. So what Texas's plan does is it demonstrates that the state is on track um, to meet natural visibility conditions by 2064. That's the deadline that EPA chose and put in the um, Federal Register in its regulations for all states. Um, I understand that some states aren't, aren't meeting that. Uh, Texas has demonstrated that it will meet that. Um, so in my mind, I think the inquiry could, could end there. We are on a path to achieving EPA's goal. The state is on track. Um, but Texas also examined the costs and benefits of imposing additional controls on 18 sources expected to contribute to visibility impairments. And um, as you saw in the backup material, I'm sure using a cost threshold of $5,000 per ton for NOx and SO2, there would be no perceptible change in visibility at any of the seven relevant class one areas. But there would be a big cost. The cost would be $200 million annually. And there may be additional unquantified costs in terms of electric reliability. So this is modeled, it's quantified. At $200 million annually, the area with the greatest improvement, the biggest impact on visibility would be the Caney Creek Wilderness Area in Arkansas. And that area would have an incremental improvement of 0.56 deciviews. And visibility changes are understood to be imperceptible uh, until they reach one deciview. So with respect to visibility, if we're looking at visibility, there's no question that Texas's plan is reasonable. And I think the act is clear that these regional haze requirements are solely about visibility. So I'm ready to adopt this SIP provision. Commissioner Lindley, what are your thoughts? Um, I don't have anything to add in addition to that. Thanks for laying it out. Um, I too am also comfortable with the adoption of the of what's before us today. Commissioner Janeka? I'm, I'm also in agreement. While I, while I find myself uh, also in, in partial agreement with many of the points raised by the commenters, I, I ultimately fundamentally agree with you that these, uh, those are ancillary additional uh, considerations that really are not called for in the decision before us and our obligations to respond to EPA and, and this portion of the Clean Air Act. I'm, I'm comfortable moving forward today. And, and I, I think we're all fully aware that these these are issues that uh, continue to be litigated and discussed by by many parties and many many players and and another very important piece of this is merely where where that larger story that our agency's uh, interactions with EPA and this issue I think feeds into the the action today I think it's appropriate and we're ready to continue the discussion with our federal and and stakeholders across the country. Thank uh, you. Appreciate that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, 
I well, think we're ready for a motion. I, I would move that we adopt the 2021 Regional Hayes SIP revision as recommended by the Executive Director. I second the motion. The motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 The motion carries. Ms. Smith, please call the next item. Item 36 is the consideration of the agency post-incident response actions related to the February 2021 severe winter storm, including plans to evaluate factors that impact public water system response and recovery actions. And I think the executive director staff is here to, to, to lay it out. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman, Commissioners, General Counsel, and Public Interest Counsel. For the record, I'm Terry Michelle LaKyle. I'm the Deputy Director of the Water Supply Division. I'm here to provide the monthly update for the agency's after-action review of Winter Storm URI. The Public Water System Survey was completed and made available in mid-May. To date, we have received 348 responses. The survey will continue to remain available for public water systems on the agency's Winter Storm webpage. Looking at demographics of the respondents, about 90% represent community public water systems, and the majority of the respondents represent systems that have between 1,000 and 10,000 service connections. Half of the survey respondents stated that they had lost the ability to provide treatment or distribute water, so the project team is carefully evaluating causation of those issues. One of the most surprising things that we are learning is that systems sustain significant damage to critical electrical components from the surges generated during the rolling blackouts. To address this issue, we have developed guidance to assist water systems to prepare for rolling blackouts and electrical outages, to minimize damages and losses, and to prevent interruption of critical services. The guidance is now available on the agency's disaster and recovery webpage, and uh, a link is also provided on the Winter Storm URI webpage. Some of the most common methods reported that systems used to prepare for the storm was insulating plant piping and chemical feed lines, increasing fuel supplies for genera generators, and increasing staffing for additional coverage during and after the storm. The project team is evaluating which method or combination of methods were the most effective for maintaining operations. More than half of the public water systems that responded stated that they did not have a mutual aid agreement so we will develop and distribute educational materials outlining the benefits of having this type of agreement. Over half of the respondents stated that they needed emergency response training exercises. The project team is currently coordinating several training events to be conducted over the summer and fall to provide water systems resources to plan, conduct, and evaluate exercises that focus on water sector related hazards. Additionally, a significant portion of the agency's public drinking water conference in August is dedicated to water system resiliency training. We have begun our roundtable discussions and held the first meeting on June 29th. We had approximately 50 participants. The discussion focused on adequacy of power resources, impacts to water system infrastructure, and what is needed to prepare for future weather-related events. The virtual meetings have been scheduled throughout the month of July, and participants can register for any of the meetings on the Winter Storm webpage. The project team continues discussions with other state agencies to learn from their experiences, as well as gathering information on what they are working on related to the impacts of the storm. The Texas Division of Emergency Management and the Public Utility Commission joined the roundtable discussion yesterday to share information from their perspective areas. We are also continuing to gather information by contacting drinking water programs in other states to learn about what they, are, what they do relating to weatherization, design standards, and best practices to prepare for weather-related events that could be beneficial for Texas systems. That concludes our monthly update. We welcome any feedback that you may have, and I'm available to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. LaKyle. Um, I don't have any questions at this point. Uh, Commissioner Lindley, any questions? No questions, thank you. Commissioner Janeka. None. I'm, I'm really pleased to see that guidance and, and uh, that level of, of direction and response is already going out to respondents and, and public entities from what we've learned. And I certainly hope that that number of responses we've received today continues to grow as we hear further updates on this issue. Yeah, I agree. I really appreciate all the efforts that, that um, have been made already to, you know, to start 
addressing the problems that we have identified in terms of guidance and training and so forth. You know, I'm wondering, and I think this is probably a conversation for another day, is, is you know, which, uh, which practices might we consider uh, promulgating as rules to make enforceable, which, which should we, um, you know, maintain as, as guidance, as, as suggestions. And, um, and I'm also struck that these, these uh, many of these small water systems are under tremendous burdens already. And so I want to, I want to help them provide better services. I don't want to get in their, their way and saddle them with something that's, that's challenging. So that's, that's the balancing act. But um, Ms. LaKyle, thank you very much. I appreciate everything that your team is doing on this. Um, if there's nothing else, there's no action required on this report and seeing nothing. So Ms. Smith, I will ask you to call the next items. Items 37 through 40 are for closed session. The commission will not meet in closed session today. The time is 1142. We are adjourned. <laughs>